uh, is an example of dumb resource, then stop after that. Is that good? <laughs> because that'll take us quite a bit, I think. And the rest of the uh, approaches uh, that I have in mind are actually all in the slides, so you can take a look at them. Uh, so if you look at a mini core system, there are many shared resources. You already know this very well. And threads interfere with, in these resources. And if you have a, a smart cache, a smart memory controller, and a smart interconnect, what might happen is the independent mechanisms that you design there can contradict each other. And this is what we've seen. And we'll sh I'll show you results later. Explicitly coordinating these mechanisms such that your smart interconnect is uh, coordinated with your smart memory scheduler, such that they may coordinate decisions, uh, may require complex implementations. And people have actually studied this problem. They look at machine learning techniques to allocate enough band cache uh, space, memory bandwidth, and interconnect bandwidth at the same time. And uh, those techniques have complex implementations. Maybe there are other approaches, but we do not know them yet. The key question is, how do we enable fair sharing of this entire memory system by controlling interference in a coordinated manner? So an alternative approach to designing each resource to be smart is to do source throttling. Basically, instead of managing inter-thread interference at the cores, uh, at, the, at the shared resources, we want to share, uh, manage it at the cores. Basically, at the periphery of the shared resources instead of within the shared resources. And the approach we're going to take is going to consist of several steps. First, uh, the system will dynamically estimate unfairness in the memory, feedback this information to a controller, which could be implemented in hardware or software, but needs to have a quick adaptation mechanisms, and throttle the core's memory access rates accordingly based on this information. Whom to throttle and by how much depends on the performance target. It could be throughput, fairness, per thread quality of service, dot, dot, dot. So we're going to have a configurable mechanism, configurable fairness mechanism. For example, if the unfairness in the system is greater than some system software specified target, we're going to throttle the core that's causing the unfairness, which means that we should know that core. We're going to throttle up the core that was unfairly treated, which means that we should know that core also. So the, the key is collecting enough information about the interference behavior of these different cores and feeding that into this controller such that this controller has knobs to throttle. And that's described in this paper in ASPLOS in 2010. And an extended version is in transactions on computer systems. Let me give you the high level pictorial insight of this. Uh, let's take a look at a system. And we're going to abstract the system uh, shared memory resources a queue of re requests to shared resources. And this is the oldest one. Let's say these two applications compute. They generate requests in this order. A is a very memory intensive application. B is not so intensive. And B gets delayed behind A, potentially, right? Because A is injecting lots of requests very quickly. As a result, core A has some stall time, and core B has some stall time that's longer, even though it injects less, fewer requests. In this case, intensive application generates many requests and causes long stall times for less intensive application B. And we've seen this problem many times, right? This is MATLAB versus GCC, for example. Now, the key insight with fair source throttling is if you, if you can somehow figure this out, you can tweak this request generation order. You can say, instead of, you can say, I can, uh, the system can say, I'm going to slow down A for a while such that it doesn't inject as frequently or as fast, such that B can inject its request. And that's the idea. A can be throttled such that B can inject its request into the system. If you look at this, what will happen is A is injecting much more slowly. This way, B can inject faster. As a result, you can get a timeline like this. Core, core B's stall time will be much shorter. And core A's stall time will be longer. And in fact, it'll be longer than shown here. You get some extra cycles, but you get some additional extra cycles because you're running it slowly or you're delaying its memory requests. But you save a lot of cycles on core B. Basically, the key idea is to dynamically detect application A's interference for application B and throttle down application A. If you do this, you can get better system performance because this application is not intensive and hopefully better fairness also. And you can actually expose this to the system to do better. So how do you do this is the key question, of course, right? There are two components in fairness via source throttling. It's an interval-based mechanism. The first one is runtime unfairness evaluation that's done in hardware. 
which adds enough hardware counters to the system such that you can dynamically estimate the unfairness in the memory system and estimate which application is slowing down which other one. And you feed this information into a controller which does dynamic request throttling, which is a second component. This could be hardware or software. It adjusts how aggressively each core makes requests to the shared resources. It throttles down request rates of the cores that are causing unfairness. And we'll have two mechanisms to do this. First, we can limit injection rate. You can say this core should not inject for 1,000 cycles, for example. Or we can limit the missed buffers. We can limit the parallelism of the cores, how many missed buffers a core can use. And we're going to use both. Let's take a look at the high level operation. We have these two mechanisms, unfairness evaluation and dynamic request throttling. And this is an interval based mechanism. During the first interval, we estimate the, the system estimates the slowdown of each thread. And this is fed to uh, the runtime unfairness evaluation system. Uh, basically, it estimates unfairness, finds the application with the highest slowdown based on the slowdown estimation, and finds the application that's causing the most interference for the slowest application, high, uh, highest slowdown application. And you can do this if you can keep track of interference of the different cores with each other. And that's what we're going to do. And if you have this information, at the end of the interval, this unfairness estimate, uh, app slowest, which is the application with the highest slowdown, and app interfering, which is the application causing the most interference to app slowest, is fed to this dynamic request throttling engine, which will, uh, based, on the, based on the target, based on the goal that's specified by system software, do something. And for example, if the goal is to maximize unfairness, uh, maximize fairness, uh, this system will compare unfairness estimate to the target, which is over here. Target is provided by the system software. If the system is satisfying the unfairness estimate, it's not, it won't do anything. If the unfairness estimate is not satisfied, this the target is not satisfied, uh, the request throttling engine throttles the app interfering, the application that's interfering the most, and throttles the application that throttles up the application that's the slowest. And you can actually imagine many different policies. This may not be the best policy. This is a like, step by step policy, right? You could, you could design more predictive policies once you have these information. So then the key question is how do you actually figure out the application with the highest slowdown or application with different slowdowns, right? Uh, you already know what's unfairness, right? Maximum slowdown over all applications divided by minimum slowdown over all applications. And the slowdown of an application is time it's taken sharing its resources, time it's taken when it's run alone. And again, the key question always is, how do you estimate T alone in shared mode? We're going to take an approach that's similar to stall time fair memory scheduling. I'm not going to go into too much detail again. The you can read the paper. But the key is that uh, T excess is the number of extra cycles it takes an application to execute due to interference. And you can express T alone as T shared minus T excess for each application. So how do you compute TXS? Basically, we track intercore interference. Uh, there are three interference sources in the system that we look at. One is a shared cache. The other is the DRM bus and bank. And the other is the DRM row buffers. And we need to keep track of interference per core for each of these resources. This is the interference per core bit vector for each core. And uh, this bit is set when the core is being interfered with. Uh, by another core. So let's take a look at the hardest case. The hardest case is the row buffers, actually. Uh, let's say we have these two cores, two applications, that are accessing the same bank. Uh, row A uh, is open, and core 0 has a request to row A, and core 1 has request to, two requests to row B. And you have these queue of requests. This is the interference per core bit vector for this resource. And if you want to keep track of interference in the row buffer, you need to have shadow row address registers. Basically, this, these denote the row address that would have been open if this application, if this core was running alone by itself. Right? It's shadow. It's, like, it's em emulating the alone execution. Uh, let's say this uh, core 0 has a request to row A. And its shadow row address register is changed to row A. because if it were running alone, it will uh, keep row A open. This is a row hit. Let's say you get a row conflict for row B for core 1. Its shadow, shadow row address register has changed to row B. Because if it were running alone, the row buffer would contain row B. Now let's say core 0 has an access to row A. In this case, it gets a row conflict. 
But if it were running alone, it wouldn't get a row conflict, right? Because you look at its shadow row address register, it's row A, but the real row address register is row B. Some other application must have interfered with it. And that's what happened. You get a row conflict. This is an interference-induced row conflict because you can know that by, check, uh, by checking the requests. Uh, basically, the memory controller says this is a row conflict, but the shadow row address register says this is not a row conflict. Right? You can know that easily. And if that's the case, the interference per core bit vector for core 0 is set because it's being delayed. That's the idea. So that's how we set the interference per core bit vectors. And once the interference per core bit vector is set, how do we compute the excess cycles? That's the next step. Basically, we have excess cycle counters per core, TI excess. And these counters uh, get incremented every time a core is being interfered with. So let's say we have the interference in the memory controller. The memory controller says core 0 is being interfered with. It sets the bit vector, just like I've shown earlier. And every cycle, the core that, have its, that has its interference per core bit vector set increments its t excess counters. That's the idea. The core doesn't do that, but the logic over here increments the t excess counter of the cores that have their interference per core bit vector set. That's the idea. For example, at cycle t plus 2, uh, the t excess of core 0 is 2 because its interference per core uh, bit vector is set for two cycles. Right? Let's say shared cache later says, oh, core 2 is being interfered with in the cache. And you can look at the paper for these mechanisms that detect interference in the shared cache. Then in the following cycles, until this bit is reset, the excess of core 2 keeps getting incremented. So when do you, set the, when do you reset this bit? When the, when the request that received interference gets serviced, the shared cache says, oh, I've serviced this request. Now this core is not being interfered with. That's how the bit is reset. Okay. So then the next question is, now we've figured out, uh, so once you have these TXS cycles, now you can do this computation, right? T alone equals T shared minus T excess. That way you get uh, the T alone. Now you can get the slowdown of all applications. But how do you get the application that's causing the most interference for the slowest application? Let's take a look at that. To identify this, for each core, uh, our mechanism separately tracks interference caused by each core. So we have, instead of having an interference per core bit vector, we change that to a pairwise interference bit matrix. And uh, the row addresses show the interfering core, and column addresses show the interfered with core in this case. And we also make the excess cycles uh, to be a matrix. These are actually pairwise excess cycles matrix. Basically. If you look at this, uh, this particular bit over here says uh, core 2 is interfering with core 1. And while this is set, this counter is incremented until this bit is reset. That's the idea. That way you know which core is interfering with the other core by how much. In this case, if the application slowest is 2, which is core 2, the row with the largest count determines which application uh, is interfering most with that particular application. Right? So it's simple. Once you have pairwise interference counts, you can figure out which one is the most interfering. So this is the least scalable part of the system, actually. This is the old version of the mechanism. The new version of the mechanism. So it, it, this is least scalable because you, have, you need to have n-square counters, right? Uh, if you have n cores, you need to have n-square counters. So we have a linear mechanism. Uh, in the transactions on computer systems paper that is described that does not even does not lose much accuracy compared to this. And the linear mechanism, the key idea is basically you aggregate some counters. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So now we have the slowdowns, we have the app slowest, we have the unfairness, and we have which application is interfering most. How do we actually do the dynamic request throttling? The goal here is to adjust how aggressively each core makes requests to the memory system. Right? There are two mechanisms that I briefly touched on. The first is having a quota on miss buffers, miss status holding registers. This controls the number of parallel requests accessing shared resources from each application. And the second is 
to control the request injection frequency. This controls how often memory requests are issued to the last level cache from uh, the missed buffers. And these are two different things, actually. One is injection frequency, one is how much parallelism you get. This is rate versus parallelism. And basically, we have a throttling level assigned to each core that determines both of these. And there is a big design space here. This is, uh, this is what we employ in the end. For different throttling levels, you have different uh, misbuffer quotas and request injection rates. For example, a throttling level of 10% means that you can inject at most 12 requests, and you can inject once every 10 cycles. Right? This 12 concurrent requests uh, for a total number of MSHRs of 128. So we never actually throttle the core fully, because that, it turns out that reduces system throughput a lot. So the, even the lowest throttling level keeps injecting some requests, but only every 50 cycles or so. I'm sure you can do better mechanisms than this. This is a very large design space, I think. OK, so how does this work? Let's take a look at, uh, again, a cartoonish example. In one interval, you do slowdown estimation. And uh, let's say this is the throttling level at interval i. At the end of the interval, let's say these are the estimates that are provided by this unfairness evaluation engine to the dynamic request throttling engine, system software fairness goal is to achieve a fairness of 1.4. Achieve, yeah, achieve a fairness of 1.4, unfairness of 1.4. In this case, the unfairness is greater than the goal. As a result, uh, core 2, which is ap the slowest application, which is the application with the maximum slowdown, is throttled up. Uh, that should be over here, throttled up core 2. And the core zero, which is the application that's interfering most with that application, is throttled down. So that's what happens. In the next interval, unfairness estimate is still greater than the system software fairness goal. As a result, app slowest is throttled up, and app interfering is throttled down. And the system operates like this continuously. So there's system software support. Once you have these estimates, you can have different fairness objectives. And this actually. Uh, the paper has results showing that you could provide some predictable performance uh, with these mechanisms. Basically, uh, instead of what we've discussed, instead of keeping unfairness in check, we could keep maximum slowdown in check because we have the max slowdown values of all applications, right? Basically, we can trigger throttling if the estimated max slowdown is greater than target max slowdown. Or we can, we can try to satisfy this goal, right? Estimate, uh, to be, uh, have the ex estimated max slowdown less than some target max slowdown. We could also keep the slowdown of particular applications in check to achieve a particular performance target, right? We can uh, try to keep an estimated slowdown of an application I to be less than a target slowdown of an application I. And once we see this violated, we can uh, trigger throttling. So basically, the trigger condition of the throttling can change depending on different goals that could be configured by the system software. And the paper has results with these different goals. There's also support for thread priorities. Anytime I think you design a memory scheduler like this or system like this that tries to provide quality of service, you need to support thread priorities and also support different goals. Remember the configurable part uh, of, uh, of these mechanisms. And here, again, you could have a simple mechanism. Basically, each thread can have a weight and instead of using estimated slowdowns directly, we can weight that slowdown. Right? If the thread has a huge weight, then the, the estimated slowdown, the, the weighted slowdown will appear to be much larger than all other threads. Right? If the thread has a small weight, then slowdown will appear to be much slower. As a result, you can appropriately prioritize the threads. So what's the hardware cost of all of this? The total storage cost is, for four cores, it's approximately 12 kilobytes. Again, it's not costly in terms of storage. And it doesn't require any structures or logic that are on the processor's critical path. The downside is the implementation complexity. There are a lot of parts of the system that needs to keep track of these counters, I think. And uh, if you look at the accuracy of this, accuracy is uh, good for some of the goals, but the accuracy is not good for uh, the goal of predictable performance. So we found that this works in some cases with fairness resource throttling, but doesn't work as well. Uh, for all cases, because the average error is relatively high still. Remember, the average error is actually similar to uh, the average error we get for, with STFM. Okay, we evaluated this also. I'll briefly go through the results. Uh, this is the results with unfairness. So if you look at this, we actually have 
uh, a baseline mechanism with no fairness, basically uh, LRU caches, raw hit first schedulers, uh, and a fair cache capacity partitioning mechanism, virtual private caches is the second one, and parallelism over batch scheduling plus that fair cache capacity partitioning mechanism, this is more smart resources combined approach, and uh, fairness via source throttling. If you look at this, uh, on average, fairness improves significantly compared to the baseline that doesn't uh, provide any fairness mechanisms, and also significantly compared to the combination of these two smart, smart resources. There are two reasons. One is uh, the fair cache capacity partitioning mechanism actually doesn't perform too well if you, uh, for fairness, as you see this. And the second is, uh, as you combine these two different mechanisms, they interact negatively with each other. That's what we found. You partition the cache capacity, and that floods the memory system for some applications, and the memory scheduler becomes, doesn't provide as well fairness. Whereas fairness via source throttling, you can uh, actually coordinate all of the resources. What about system performance? This shows system performance normalized to the baseline with no fairness. Fair cache capacity partitioning mechanism actually reduces system, uh, system performance. Parallelism memory batch scheduling plus this fair cache capacity partitioning mechanism improves some system performance slightly, like by 10%. Actually, it's pretty good. Uh, and fairness via source throttling improves performance even more, about 25.6%. Uh, and this is still better than the smart resources combined approach. And if you look at this, there is actually room for improvement going forward. Here, there are some cases where uh, dumb resources, fairness via source throttling, performs better than smart resources together. And there are some cases where fairness via source throttling doesn't do well. Right? So we don't get the best of both worlds. So the best of both worlds will probably happen by combining uh, the approaches, smart resources and dumb resources, in some intelligent way. So basically, there's nothing that says you cannot combine source throttling with smart resources, right? If you do that, you probably get a much better system. A little bit more complex, but then that complexity is interesting. Then you, how do you manage that complexity with different techniques becomes interesting. I think. So the takeaways of the results, source throttling alone provides better performance than a combination of smart memory scheduling and fair caching. Uh, this is because decisions made at the memory scheduling and the cache sometimes contradict each other. But the second takeaway is neither source throttling alone nor these smart resources together alone provides the best performance. So combined approaches are even more powerful. We've seen some results with this, but I think uh, a full exploration of this is this would be very interesting. Okay. Any questions on this? I covered this relatively quick. Yes. What happens if two cores actually have uh, mutual interference for one? Yes, it can happen. And then in that case, you keep uh, incrementing the different counters. Basically, you have core one interfere with core two counter and core two interfere with core one counter. Can both applications go down, slow down? Uh, that's right. If they're both uh, interfering with each other equally, then they take turns in being throttled. Yeah. That's an interesting case. I think you can optimize for many different cases here. We didn't fully optimize, we just wanted to prove the uh, concept. I think uh, you, uh, reducing the complexity of these combination of mechanisms and also uh, optimizing it for different cases would be a good, good future work. Any, any other questions? This is a completely different approach from what we've seen before, right? You're actually managing interference at the periphery rather than in the shared resources. Okay, I guess let me give you one more mechanism. People are becoming tired. I guess today is not Friday, so it's not that bad, but. <laughs> I'll talk about quality of service over data mapping to memory controllers. Uh, I was planning to talk about quality of service over thread scheduling to cores also, but we have slides for that and the papers uh, for that as well. Uh, the idea here is memory channel partitioning. So when we, uh, when we were looking at these different approaches, one other way of reducing interference is if you map the data of two threads that are interfering with each other to different memory channels, memory controllers, they won't interfere with each other, right? You can eliminate interference. Uh, our goal is to again mitigate inter-application interference, and many previous approaches do application-aware memory request scheduling. 
So we're going to look at a first approach that does application-aware memory channel partitioning. And then we're going to look at an integrated approach that integrates request scheduling and channel partitioning. So let's take a look at the previous approach very briefly, because I, we've just looked at this. If you look at application-aware memory request scheduling, usually the scheduler operates this way. It monitors application memory access characteristics. It ranks the applications based on memory access characteristics. It prioritizes the request at the memory controller based on this ranking. For example, thread cluster memory scheduling, you already know that it basically clusters applications or threads into two different groups, prioritizes the non-intensive cluster, and employs different policies that are both ranking based in each cluster. The advantages, it reduces interference between applications by request reordering and it improves system performance. Right. But there are disadvantages also. Uh, this requires modifications to the memory scheduling logic for ranking and prioritization, and we've seen how scalable it is. Uh, for, uh, with the request buffer sizes. And this also cannot completely eliminate interference by request reordering. Right? You're just reordering requests. You're not fundamentally, fundamentally eliminating interference. You're reducing it, but interference is still there. So we're going to look at memory channel partitioning, which exploits the fact that you have different memory channels. Right? Modern systems have multiple channels, and almost, uh, actually all modern systems have mul multiple channels at general purpose high performance processors. So this provides a new degree of freedom, which is the mapping of data across multiple channels. And you have pages, uh, in, in today's systems, an application's pages can go to all memory channels. As a result, you get interference uh, between application's requests. But with memory channel partitioning, you could do something like this. One application's request goes to this channel, another application's request goes to this channel. Right. This eliminates interference between different application requests. The key question is how do you do that? Right? You don't have uh, systems as beautiful as this. You have three applications with two memory channels. Right. You usually have many, many cores that are sharing a few memory channels. So we'd like to be careful in partitioning the channels. Basically, the goal is to eliminate harmful interference between applications. Not all interference is harmful. Sometimes it's, the applications interfere with each other, but it's not that bad, right? Whereas some applications, if, you, if a streaming application interferes with a random access application, the application interference is very bad. The basic idea is to map the data of badly interfering applications to different channels. And the key principles, which I'll show you pictorially, is if you separate applications that have low memory intensity and high memory intensity to different channels, that's a good idea. And I've shown you that before, right? Because the l application that has lower memory intensity can make much faster progress. So a lot of the key principles of scheduling and prioritization and mapping are similar, right? And the second is separate the low and high robo for locality applications to different channels, right? If the applications have different localities, you'd like to separate them. Uh, so if you can expose this, if you can figure this out and expose this to the operating system, you can do much better. But in today's operating systems, actually, you cannot do this very well. Uh, for the reasons that we've discussed earlier. Today's operating systems don't know the mapping uh, to uh, different banks, data mapping to different channels, actually. And today's operating systems don't have a good idea of what would your robo for locality be in the applications. So how do you do this? Uh, I think we've already covered this. High memory intensity applications interfere with low memory uh, intensity applications and shared memory resources. If you look at the red application, uh, without co with conventional page mapping, it may generate requests here, and the blue application gets delayed because it maps to the same channel as the red application. Whereas if you had the luxury of doing this, red application would use this, and blue application would use this. As a result, uh, you get much better performance for both applications. You're lucky in this case because uh, this is a cooked up example. Both applications' performance improves. This application finishes after four cycles instead of five cycles, five time units. And this application finishes after four, uh, one time unit instead of four time units. Right? That's the key idea. You save a lot of cycles. Map data of low and high memory intensity applications to different channels. The second is high robo for locality applications interfere with low robo for locality applications and shared memory channels. And let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Although you, you know this based on the principles that we've discussed, right? This is applications that have high robo for locality versus high bank level parallels. Uh, Basically, these are two applications, again, blue and red. And the red application has high robo for locality. It's accessing robo for zero, whereas red applica blue application doesn't have good robo for locality. With conventional page mapping, you can map these two applications in the same channel. Right? 
And as a result, you get a service order that looks like this. If you use first ready, first come, first serve scheduling, this red application delays the blue application for a while, right? And this is the t time units that you would get. Whereas if you map these applications to different channels, you would get a service order that looks like this. Basically, uh, you save a lot of cycles in the blue application because the application that has good robo for locality doesn't delay that application. This is a streaming application, and this is not the streaming application. This is more random access application, right? So the key insight is map the data of applications that have low and high robo for locality to different channels. So how do you do this is the, key, is, the, is the question, right? The mechanism consists of five stages. First, we'd like to profile the applications to figure out their characteristics. Then we'd like to classify them into groups. We'd like to partition channels between application groups assign a preferred channel to each application, and we're going to be soft here, not hard, because if we do hard partitioning, then you lose memory space. Uh, and we're going to allocate the application pages to the preferred channel. Profiling of the applications will be done in hardware, and everything else can actually be done in, be done in system software. So how do you profile applications? Basically, we have hardware contours that collect application memory ca characteristics. Memory intensity, last level cache misses per kilo instruction can be collected. Robo for locality, this actually can be collected today, although not on a per application basis easily. Some, some systems provide that, but some systems do not provide that. Robo for locality is a lot harder to collect today. Well, actually, I don't know of any performance counters that collect this for on a per application basis today. Basically, the robo for hit rate is a percentage of access that hit in the robo for. We're going to collect that. Once you have this, these two values for each application, we're gonna, uh, the operating system can classify the applications now. First, it can test what is the misses per kilo instruction, what is the uh, memory intensity of the application. If it's low, it can be categorized as low intensity. If it's high, it will be categorized as high intensity. And only for high intensity applications, we're going to look at whether it's low robo for locality or high robo for locality. Right? For low intensity applications, it doesn't matter. The locality doesn't matter that much. If, uh, and the, the application could be high intensity and low robo for locality, or high intensity and high robo for locality. And we're going to treat these three different classes of applications differently. The third step is to partition channels among groups. And this consists of multiple sub-steps within itself. We have a bunch of channels on this side, and we have a bunch of categories, actually three categories on this side. And there are different applications within each category. Uh, and we're going to partition the channels this way. Low intensity applications take some number of channels, and high intensity applications take some other number of channels. That's the first step. And to do that, we assign the number of channels proportional to the number of applications in each group. So if you have four low intensity applications, four high intensity applications, we have proportional assignment. We're going to fix that problem later. This causes some imbalance, but this leads to low intensity applications to be isolated from high intensity applications. So now that we've assigned channels to low intensity applications and high intensity applications, how do we partition up channels between these two groups, low robo for locality and high robo for locality? Basically, we assign the number of channels proportional to the bandwidth demand of each group. Basically, we have some bandwidth demand here, some bandwidth demand here. We proportionally partition the channels. And eventually, you get an assignment that looks like this. So, uh, and the paper has a lot more details related to this, but uh, that's the key idea. And we're going to fix that, uh, fix, fix one problem. If you actually assign a lot of channels to low intensity applications, you underutilize the channels in your system, right? That's why we're going to use some memory scheduling to get rid of some of these applications uh, in the mapping. So, once you have uh, this channel assignment, now, you, within, uh, you, you, now we've allocated channels to groups. We'd like to assign a preferred channel to each application from its group's allocated channels. Basically, to be, to be able to do this, we distribute the applications to channels such that the group's bandwidth demand is balanced across its channels. That's the idea. So you have, let's say you have this low intensity group that's accessing channel one and channel two. And these are the different uh, intensities of applications, memory request rates, and PKIs of applications. We assign these two applications over here such that the aggregate rate is similar to the aggregate rate that's uh, over on this channel. So we load balance the channels in terms of bandwidth. So once you do that, now each application is a pre preferred channel, right? Uh, and the fifth step, the latest step, is to allocate the page to the preferred channel. 
And the idea here is to enforce the channel preferences computed in the previous step. On a page fault, the operating system allocates the page to the preferred channel if free page is available in the preferred channel. That's why this is soft. If a free page is not available, then the replacement policy tries to allocate the page to the preferred channel. And uh, the idea over here is that basically you try to replace a page uh, from uh, from a channel that's from, from the channel that's preferred. So we modify the clock algorithm, uh, the algorithm that tries to find a free page uh, in the operating system, to look ahead a little bit to figure out uh, a page that's available from that channel that's preferred. And if your look ahead is not enough to find a page that's uh, in the same channel, then we say, okay, a free page is not available from the preferred channel, so we fail. We allocate page to the to some other channel. So it's, a, it's an opportunistic mechanism that biases the replacement to the preferred channel. Hard partitioning is not a good idea because that leads to hard partitioning of memory across different applications. So this is again interval based, uh, what I call dynamic mechanisms that we've been looking at. Basically in the current interval you profile the applications. At the end of the interval the system software classifies applications into groups, partitions channels between groups, and assigns preferred channels to applications. In the next interval, uh, the system software enforces channel preferences. So I've told you the previous approach. I've told you the first approach, application aware memory channel partitioning. This was request scheduling. So we're going to combine these two, integrated memory partitioning and scheduling, to achieve something better. And this is motivated by one observation. Ab applications with low memory intensity rarely access memory. Maybe rarely is uh, too strong, but they access memory much less frequently. If you dedicate channels to them, this results in, pre, uh, in, a, in a, a waste of uh, the memory bandwidth. Right. On the other hand, these applications have the most potential to keep their cores busy. Right. You really would like to prioritize these applications in the memory scheduler. And they also interfere minimally with other applications that I have told you earlier. Prioritizing them does not hurt others. Given these three demands, it just makes sense to always prioritize very low memory intensity applications in the memory scheduler. We basically pr always prioritize these applications. And for the remaining applications, we use memory channel partitioning to mitigate interference between them. This way, you can much better utilize your channels and still get the benefit of separating low intensity applications from high intensity applications in memory. So the hardware cost of all this, if you just use memory channel partitioning, the first mechanism, you just need all profiling counters in hardware. There's no modification to the memory scheduling logic. This can operate with first ready, first come, first serve scheduling. And you get 1.5 kilobyte storage cost for a 24 core, four channel system. So it's very low. And it's actually much simpler than many other mechanisms also. Uh, because you don't change the scheduling logic at all, right? This is just counters. You just keep track of robo for locality as well as uh, misses per thousand instructions. If you do integrated memory partitioning and scheduling, in addition to this, you, you need to add a single bit per request, saying that this is a low memory intensity application, right? And scheduler prioritizes uh, uh, the requests that have that bit set. And this is actually much simpler than other previous uh, mechanisms that we've discussed. So this is similar methodology. We have a bunch of multi-programmed workloads. And I'll show you results. Uh, and the paper has results with many different metrics. And I think we have looked at uh, many uh, memory scheduling mechanisms. And you know all of them, so I'm going to skip them. Basically, this is a summary of the results. The details are in the paper. Uh, this is normalized system performance average across 230 workloads. And if you look at this, uh, I guess one takeaway is that this is actually a much more improved model and a lot of different workloads. Uh, memory channel partitioning improves performance better than previous approaches. And if you actually integrate memory channel partitioning with uh, Scheduling, integrated memory partitioning and scheduling, you improve performance even more. And you actually do better than the best previous scheduling mechanism. It's 1% better in this case. But at, the, at a very small hardware cost, right, with memory channel partitioning. OK. So the interaction of this with other memory scheduling algorithms is very interesting, and it's not explored as much. Basically. Uh, you can have the baseline memory scheduler to be first ready, first come, first serve, 
or ATLAS or TCM. And this is the performance improvement you get averaged over these set of workloads. Uh, and this is a different set of workloads than we've looked at. It really depends on the workload as you, uh, what you get. This, this workload mix tends to be less memory intensive. If you do not do uh, integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling, this is the performance you get. If you add memory par uh, partitioning and scheduling, you get this kind of weird behavior. Basically, we improve performance significantly compared to FRFCFS scheduler, whereas the performance improvements are not as high on these other schedulers. And in fact, if you look at IMPs alone, implement on different schedulers, the performance uh, you get with Atlas and TCM is not very good, right? You'd rather have IMPs implement on top of a row hit first scheduler. Well, the reason is you get high, high performance improvement because IMPS is designed for FRFCFS, right? We're really designing the memory channel partitioning mechanism uh, based on a scheduler in mind. We didn't design it based on thread cluster memory scheduling in mind, right? If we design it, maybe we'll come up with a very different memory, memory channel partitioning mechanism. I do not know what that would be, but that would probably be not IMPS because IMPS is trying to separate applications that would interfere a lot with each other given the scheduler. And that's a very different set of applications, perhaps, with thread cluster memory scheduling. So I'd be curious how this would change if you actually customize your memory channel partitioning mechanism for the scheduler that you have. And I think that design space is very interesting also, again. Uh, how, do you, how do you design your scheduler and partitioner, and maybe even application scheduler, the thread scheduler, to get to be aware of each other, to be more coordinated with each other? So I think this result points out, points out the importance of coordinating or co-designing your different mechanisms to be aware of each other. Okay, I guess to summarize, I sh uh, I, I've been showing that uncontrolled inter-application interference and main memory degrade system performance. Uh, the idea of application-aware memory channel partitioning separates the data of badly interfering applications to different channels, eliminating interference in many cases. And integrated memory partitioning and scheduling improves upon that by combining it with very little intelligent memory scheduling, application aware memory scheduling, by prioritizing low memory intensity applications in the scheduler and handling all other applications interference by partitioning. And this improves better, uh, improves performance compared to the best previous application aware memory scheduling policies at much lower hardware cost. Because a lot of the uh, work is actually done by the system software or, or the firmware, something low level. I guess I'll conclude here. Uh, any questions on channel partitioning? Okay. Basically, we looked at many different approaches, uh, smart versus dumb resources, quality of service over memory scheduling, source throttling, and channel partitioning. And I've shown that both approaches are effective in reducing interference, but no single best approach for all workloads. So you would like to combine things. We looked at many different techniques also, request scheduling, source throttling, and memory partitioning. Again, all approaches are effective in reducing interference and can be applied actually at different levels, hardware versus software, but there's no single best technique for all workloads. And combined approaches and techniques are the most powerful usually. For example, integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling is better than scheduling or partitioning alone. So there are other approaches which I will not go into. Quality of service aware thread uh, scheduling to cores. This is a recent uh, HPCA paper that we've looked at basically uh, this is a more scalable system. We're looking at interference in the entire memory system, including the interconnect. And how do you do the thread scheduling to cores to minimize interference? This also does some data partitioning as well, actually, clustering of the data. I have the slides right after this next slide, and you can feel free to take a look at that, and I'd be happy to talk about that with anyone. I guess I'll conclude all of the lectures. In, the, in this second, uh, part, uh, second lecture, in general, we looked at technology, application, and architecture trends that dictate new needs from the memory system. And uh, I said we should take a look at, fresh look at redesigning the entire memory hierarchy uh, with three goals in mind. Actually, we've discussed two of them in more detail, but efficiency comes out of both of them, I think. Uh, scalability, uh, we've discussed DRAM system co-design and new, te new technologies to make the memory system much more scalable. And Moin's talk this morning actually discussed how to use new technologies uh, uh, for the same purpose uh, with different approaches. And the second was quality of service, which was the subject of this talk. Reducing and controlling main memory interference leads to a much more quality of service aware and much more predictable system design also. 
Uh, well, efficiency, I think, comes out of both, but you could actually design a more customizable memory system that doesn't waste and that perhaps uses new technologies to improve efficiency. Uh, for this lecture, quality of service unaware memory leads to uncontrollable and uncontrollable, unpredictable system. We solve this problem, or we're still solving this problem, uh, by providing quality of service awareness. And I've discussed many approaches. Providing quality of service awareness improves all metrics, actually, which is interesting. It improves performance, predictability, fairness, and utilization of the memory system. It also improves efficiency. We haven't looked at that that much, but a lot of the results indicate that you get much better system efficiency by doing all of that. I think I'll stop here and take any questions, but that's, this is probably a good place to stop. <laughs> it's already 520. And these are the slides that you can look at. This is uh, one of the newest works. Any questions, comments? Actually, we'd like to thank you for just coming here and making all the presentations for us. So, shall we? Check the other boxes up Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. And I hope to visit again, and more often, hopefully. <laughs>